Welcome and thank you for joining us for our Services Australia webinar. Today's presentation is Aged Care Fees and Charges Part 3. This is the final series of our Part 3 ser uh, series. My name is Donna and I'm a Financial Information Service Officer. I will be your host for today. I'm joined today by my colleague Mandy and our wonderful team of moderators. Today's webinar is aimed at helping the Australian community understand aged care, the fees and charges, how this may affect you and a loved one entering care, and other supports that may be available. If you have not seen part one or two, these are available on our Services Australia website for viewing at any time that is suitable for you. For those of you who have joined us again, thank you. It's great to have you back. For those who might not have joined one of our live events before, we welcome you. Today, I join you from Noongar country in Western Australia. The Wujak people are the traditional custodians of the lands where I sit today. I would like to pause and say thanks to the Wujak people for looking after these lands and waterways. I am grateful for the ongoing connections to culture, land and the waterways that allow me to work and play in this area. On behalf of the webinar team, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of all the different lands we live on and that you are joining us from today. I pay my respects to all elders past and present of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nations. The information in this webinar is a guide only. It is current at a particular date and is subject to change. Please refer to our website for for further information and to keep up to date with current rates of payment and any legislative changes. Like all presentations, there are a few things we would like to share with you before the main topic. So let's start with some webinar housekeeping. If you are attending our webinar as a live event, we have a live question and answer feature, which you can access by typing your question in a Q&A box located above on the top right hand side of your screen. It's an icon that looks a little bit like a speech bubble and it's got a question mark on it and this will open the Q&A feature for you. Now we want to protect your privacy, so when you go to ask a question, please use your first name only or alternatively you can tick the box to send your question anonymously. If you ask us a great question that we think everyone should know the answer to, we may publish it for all to see. Other questions, we may just send the reply directly back to you. Before we start on today's topic, let's do a recap of what was covered in part one and then part two. Remembering that you can view the two previous days, part one and two's live events as a watch now from our Services Australia website. In part one, our aged care specialist officer Mandy took us through some great information. We covered the role of the Financial Information Service Officer and how the Aged Care Specialist Officer can support you to navigate the aged care process. We also talked through the steps of entering care, along with the assessments needed and care options at home from Commonwealth Home Support Program and Home Care Packages. Part two, we looked at understanding fees and charges, residential care means test assessments and daily fees. We also covered annual and lifetime caps. Mandy showed us the My Aged Care website and the support that you can access online, by phone and in person. So what are we going to discuss and conclude our three part series with? In today's session, we will be looking at the costs associated with residential care. We take a look at assessable income and assessable assets. We will discuss a practical case study where you will meet Mary, who has been assessed and requires residential aged care. We will look at what options there are for her. You'll then be introduced to Bob and Billy. Now they are a couple who will eventually both enter into residential care. In these case studies, we look at one of the most common questions. Do we sell the home or retain the family home? But please do remember that these are case studies only and each of our personal circumstances may vary to some degree. 
Today's webinar is brought to you by the Financial Information Service. For those of you who have not heard about the Financial Information Service, or FIS as we are often referred to, it is a free and confidential service available to all members of the public, not just people who receive Centrelink payment. FIS provides you with independent information and education to help you understand your financial options. Now, please be aware that this is information only and not advice, and that we also support financially vulnerable customers by providing financial education to assist them in making better financial choices. If you would like to know more about what FIS do, please have a look at part one of this series. Services Australia have aged care specialist offices. Now, we like to call them an AXO. So our AXOs provide specialised aged care assistance to older Australians and their families or representatives. Today we have the privilege of having Mandy, one of our extremely knowledgeable aged care specialist officers, return as our guest speaker. Mandy will go through two case studies with us today. I'll now hand over to Mandy to talk all things aged care. And remember, our team of moderators are ready and waiting to answer any questions that you might have. Over to you now, Mandy. Thanks, Donna. Hello, everyone. I'm Mandy. I'm an aged care specialist with Services Australia. As an aged care specialist, I provide a face-to-face -face service for customers needing assistance in their aged care journey. I can help customers, their families and carers understand, access and navigate aged care services. You can check the Services Australia website to find out the location of aged care specialist offices. And to make an appointment, you can call our Services Australia aged care line on 1800 227 475 or you can drop into any of our offices. So let's recap the steps of entering residential care, which I explained in our earlier webinars. Step one of a move to permanent residential care is the need to have approval by the Aged Care Assessment Team or Aged Care Assessment Service, as it's known in Victoria. And this is done through My Aged Care. Step two of a move to permanent residential care is the requirement to have a residential care means test assessment completed by either Centrelink or the Department of Veterans Affairs, and this will assist to determine the costs of permanent care. Let's take a look back on the graph that we built in webinar two of this series and recap how residential care means test assessments work and how those potential costs in care are determined. So when looking at aged care means testing, remember, where a person is a member of a couple, we use 50% of combined income and assets held, regardless of which person holds them. So starting with the grey area on our graph, where a person enters care with assets below $59,500 and income below about $33,000 per annum, these people are assessed as low means at the time they enter care. They pay no accommodation costs. Their accommodation costs will be paid in full by government subsidies direct to their facility. They will pay the basic daily care fee, currently $61.96 per day. And depending on the facility they choose, there may be additional service fees applied. Moving on next to customers who fall within the blue area of our graph. These customers have assets between $59,500 and about $201,000 or income between about $33,000 and $82,500 per year. Now, these customers are also considered low means at the time they enter care, but their level of income or assets require them to make a contribution toward their accommodation costs. And this is known as the Daily Accommodation Contribution or DAC. So they pay a part of their accommodation costs with the DAC and government subsidies pay the remainder direct to their chosen facility. They'll pay the same basic daily care fee and depending on the provider, there may be additional service fees applied. Now, the daily accommodation contribution is not fixed. It can change as your circumstances change. 
if your daily accommodation contribution reduces because your income or assets have reduced, the government subsidy increases. So the facility receives the same amount from your for your accommodation, regardless of the portion you pay. The maximum daily accommodation contribution payable for a person in this blue area of the graph is currently $68.14 per day. And the amount you pay depends on your residential care means test assessment. The closer you are to the upper thresholds, the higher your daily accommodation contribution will be. Now, where a person enters care as low means and they remain in that place in care, they'll always be assessed as low means, but a change in circumstance can change the amounts they are asked to pay. And a change in circumstances could be financial, or it could be a voluntary move to a new aged care facility. Now, our final group of customers on the graph are those in the white area above the blue section. These people enter care with assets above 201,000 or income above around 82,500 per annum. And they are considered not low means at the time of entry to care. They will pay the full cost of their accommodation with no government subsidies for their accommodation cost. Their accommodation payment will be agreed with the service provider and it does not change after entry. This is known as the refundable accommodation deposit or daily accommodation payment. They will pay the same basic daily fee and they may also pay a means tested care fee depending on the amount of their income and assets. And depending on the facility they choose, they could also have additional or extra service fees payable. And remember, for our self-funded retirees, you can choose to not provide your income and asset details and be assessed as what we call means not disclosed. And in this case, you'll simply pay the full accommodation cost at your chosen facility and the maximum means tested fees applicable until you reach the caps for means tested fees. And we did talk through caps in our earlier webinar in the series. Now, as Donna mentioned earlier, I'm going to work through two case studies today, exploring entry to residential care. We're going to talk about a single person and we're going to talk about a couple. These case studies will show you the types of considerations you need to make when moving to residential care and really highlight the assistance that we here at Services Australia can provide with our financial information service and aged care specialist officers. So let's meet Mary. She's our first case study. Mary is a single person entering permanent care. She owns her home and there is no protected person in the home. Mary has had her ACAT assessment to allow a move to permanent care and she's lodged a residential care means test assessment form with Services Australia to determine what costs she may be asked to pay. Mary owns her home. It's worth about $500,000 and there's no protected person residing in the home, which means that home is included for aged care means testing, but it's the capped value that applies and that is currently $201,231. Mary also has $200,000 in investments and she has personal effects of $10,000. She gets a little overseas pension and based on the pension income and asset test rules, Mary receives a slightly reduced rate of age pension from Centrelink due to her overall assessable income. So thinking back to our graph on aged care means testing, Mary has assessable assets above the $201,000 threshold and this sees her assessed as not low means at entry to care. She would fall within the white section of our graph. Mary will need to pay for her accommodation costs in full with no government subsidies applied for accommodation. She will still receive subsidies for the care that she receives. As a not low means entrant to care, Mary has the choice of whether to pay her accommodation as a lump sum, which as a not low means resident is the refundable accommodation deposit or RAD. She can also choose to pay as a daily amount, which is that daily accommodation payment or DAP. And Mary can choose to do a combination option where she pays some of each. She needs to discuss with her provider and negotiate how to pay. 
And remember, we talked about the Find a Provider tool on the My Age Care website in our earlier webinars. Where a person enters care as not low means, that Find a Provider tool is a great resource. You can research all government funded aged care facilities where they are required to publish their maximum accommodation payments. In care, Mary will pay the basic daily care fee of $61.96 per day, and based on her means test assessment, she will also be asked to pay a means tested fee of $5.92 per day. If Mary elects a facility where extra or additional service fees apply, that would be in addition to those costs I've just discussed. So Mary's done some research. She's chosen her new home and where the refundable accommodation deposit is 350,000 and no extra or additional service fees are payable. So Mary now has some decisions to make on how to meet that accommodation cost. She can either pay uh, the lump sum in full and to do that, she may consider selling her home. She can pay it in part from the investments that she has and use that combination option with a partial RAD and the remainder paid as the daily accommodation payment. Mary can choose to pay no lump sum at all and pay the full amount as a daily amount if she wishes. Where any amount of that refundable accommodation deposit remains unpaid, the outstanding balance is used to determine the daily accommodation payment. And the current interest rate that's used in that calculation is 8.36%. So if Mary goes to permanent care and elects to pay no lump sum, that daily accommodation payment would be $80.16 per day. If she chooses to pay a partial lump sum, the daily accommodation payment would be less. So Mary can discuss her options for the family home and all these decisions she needs to make with the financial information service or aged care specialist before she makes her decision. So let's start exploring those options. And let's first look at Mary keeping her home and choosing not to rent the property. So Mary can use part of her investments to pay a lump sum. So a partial RAD, let's say $150,000. This would leave Mary with about $50,000 in investments for incidental spending, and it leaves a balance owing on the RAD of $200,000. And this will be used to determine the daily accommodation payment payable at 8.36%. So we can see here Mary's income in this situation from her age pension, that little overseas pension she has, and a small return on her savings is around $1,230 a fortnight. The aged care costs, however, are just under $1,600 per fortnight, and they're made up of the basic fee, the means tested fee and that daily accommodation payment on the unpaid room price of $200,000. Mary's expenses are around $360 a fortnight higher than her income. So she's going to need to dip into that remaining $50,000 she has in savings to cover that shortfall, as well as incidental costs, things like maintaining her family home, which she's left vacant in this option. So how long that money lasts depends on a range of factors, including that incidental spending, but this may not be a long term viable option. So looking at that negative cash flow in that first option where Mary leaves the home vacant, she explores the possibility of renting her home to improve the cash flow. Now renting the home sees the rental income assessed by Centrelink, which will one, reduce the rate of age pension, and two, increase Mary's means tested care fee. So based on the new estimates of income and expenses, Mary's overall income has increased to about 1,560 a fortnight, but her aged care costs have also increased with the higher means tested fee now payable due to the rental income. And she still has a shortfall of around $140 a fortnight in meeting aged care outlay. In last week's webinar, I talked you through the pension rules around the former home. And if you recall, the former home remains exempt for pension asset test rules for the first two years in care. And then at that point, it's included as an asset for Centrelink to determine the rate of pension. Now, Mary needs to keep in mind that rule as time moves on, because a review at the two year point might change her rate of age pension, which can impact cash flow. 
Now, the two year rule is only a pension rule. For aged care means testing, the capped value applies for as long as the former home is owned. So if we project forward to when Mary's been in care for two years, the former home is then an assessable asset for pension. And we'll assume there's been a little bit of capital growth on the property. And at that point, it's now worth about $600,000. At this time, Centrelink will assess Mary as a non-homeowner for pension purposes and a higher asset test threshold applies. We'll assume that during the first two years in care, Mary's had to dip into that savings a little bit and they've fallen to about $30,000. Therefore, at that two year point, we would see Mary's pension remained fairly stable. There's a small drop in her means tested fee and her accommodation costs have not changed as she still has the $200 outstanding on the RAD and is still paying the daily accommodation payment at the interest rate of 8.36%. So she still has a shortfall of around $130 a fortnight in covering her aged care outlay and that $30,000 in savings will continue to reduce further and at some point may leave Mary with very limited access to capital. Uh, where the home's included by an asset as Centrelink, it's also important to note that for pension purposes, we review the value of that home annually and if property prices increase, the pension may decrease. So there's a number of options to explore at this point. If Mary is not wanting to sell her family home, she can elect to allow the aged care facility to draw back on the lump sum RAD she has paid, and that can assist with cash flow. So if we look at the option of the daily accommodation payment be, being deducted from that partial RAD she's paid, the cash flow position becomes positive to the tune of $400 a fortnight. Remember, where a person allows the facility to draw back on the partial RAD paid, it means that the amount refunded when the resident leaves is the balance remaining. And it also results in the DAP increasing over time as the lump sum held by the facility reduces. It's a great idea to talk with the financial information service or an aged care specialist as the two year point in care approaches if you do still own the former home. We can give you estimates of the impacts of that change and explore the various options with you. As well as drawing down on the RAD, another option might be the Home Equity Access Scheme available through Centrelink. And there's a range of other options that can be explored. So as an alternative to keeping the family home, when Mary originally entered care, another option she can explore is to sell that home soon after the move to care and pay the RAD in full. So based on the home's value at the time she entered care, which was $500,000, and paying the full RAD of $350,000, it would see Mary with about $150,000 added to her savings giving her a total amount held of about $350,000. And that, together with the overseas pension, would reduce her age pension a little bit. The RAD that Mary's paid is exempt for Centrelink purposes, but it is an asset included in aged care means testing. And that means tested fee we can see has increased, and that is due to the loss of the capped value of the home when it's sold. The full sale proceeds are now included in accessible assets for aged care means testing, made up of the $350,000 RAD and the extra $150,000 that's moved to savings. So in this option here, Mary's income does cover the aged care expenses with a good positive cash flow. She has more money to invest and greater access to capital. She has no tenant issues or upkeep costs associated with the family home. There's no daily accommodation payment to pay. The trade-off though with selling the home is she no longer has the prospect of capital growth on property. So we've looked at Mary and a move to care and we've looked at her initial costs at the time she entered. We've explored some of the options she has moving forward. We've covered options for Mary around keeping the home, renting it, paying a partial RAD, drawing down on that RAD, and also looked at the option of selling the home and paying the RAD in full. And this is a really good example of the multiple considerations a person needs to look at in choosing the path that's right for them. And that's where our free services here at Services Australia can help. 
the Financial Information Service and Aged Care Specialist Offices can give you lots of information around these options and arm you with the knowledge to make informed decisions about your future. Now, when a person enters permanent care, they do need to make decisions around their family home. It's generally the biggest and most emotive decision to make in a move to permanent care. Do you keep the home or do you sell it? Considerations around keeping the family home include, is there a protected person there? If you sell the home, where would they go? Uh, sentimental attachment and a desire to return home to visit. You might want to check on the garden or sit in your own living room for a cup of tea. Estate planning considerations. How is the will structured? If a person's moving to care with dementia, they're unable to change their will and the structure of the will may make it more complicated if the home is sold. We can look at things like cash flow benefits as a positive in keeping the family home. The property could be rented and provide a great return to improve cash flow. And there's also the prospective capital growth that comes with property. Sometimes the family would like to hold on to the home for future beneficiaries or to move into themselves at a later date. In some cases, family members might offer to actually pay some or all of aged care costs. It's important to note here that if there is an option being explored, which uh, involves family contributing to aged care costs, please have a chat with the Financial Information Service or aged care specialist as different rules can apply depending on how costs are made. Now, some reasons for selling the home could include things like the time, cost and effort of maintaining a vacant property or managing a rental property. Taxation implications. Rental income is taxable income and so too is the age pension. So keeping the property and renting it may trigger income tax liabilities. Depending on the state you're in, there could be land tax implications in renting a property. And longer term, depending on the date you originally purchased the property, capital gains tax could also be a consideration. And for some people, the, the decision to sell is made to allow them to access a sufficient lump sum to move to their preferred aged care home. So let's move on to Bob and Billy. Bob and Billy are our second case study and they are a homeowner couple on the maximum rates of age pension. They have $80,000 in combined savings and non-financial assets of $18,000. Their home is worth $600,000. Now, Billy's been caring for Bob at home, but those care needs have increased and she's no longer able to manage. Bob's had an ACAT assessment and will now move to permanent residential care. So looking at the residential care means test assessment for Bob, Billy is remaining in the family home and will meet the protected person rules as a spouse, which means the home is not included as an asset for aged care means testing. 50% of their combined income and assets will be considered. And for Bob, this is below the $59,500 threshold and his income is below the income threshold. So casting our minds back to our graph, Bob would be in the gray area of our graph and he would enter care as low means. He would not be required to pay any accommodation costs at the time he entered care. They would be paid in full by government subsidy direct to the aged care facility. Bob will be asked to pay the basic fee only of $61.96 a day. And if he chooses a facility with no additional fees, that will be his only outlay. Now a move to permanent care by one member of a couple reassesses the rates of pension for both. And I talked about illness separated rules in our webinar last week. To recap, when one or both members of a couple enter care, they're assessed as illness separated which means we continue to apply the Partnered Pension Income and Asset Test rules, but we apply them to the higher single rates of pension. Now, the maximum rates of pension for a couple living at home together are $841.40 a fortnight each, which is what Bob and Billy were receiving. But with Bob's move to permanent care, they'll both now receive the higher rates of $1,116.30 a fortnight each. And it's important to add here, even where both members of a couple move to the same aged care facility, even in a shared room together, 
they do both still qualify for illness separated rates. So with Bob in care and Billy staying at home, Bob's only cost in care is the basic fee, which is about $867 a fortnight. His higher rate of pension covers this and it leaves him some additional funds for those incidental expenses. Now moving on, Billy's condition has changed after Bob's move to care. And she also now has had an ACAD assessment and needs to move to permanent residential care. For Billy's move to care, the home is no longer exempt for residential care means testing, as there will be no protected person remaining in the home. The capped value of the home will be included in Billy's residential means test assessment at entry. And Billy's move to care will also see Bob's aged care costs reassessed at the next monthly review based on the loss of the protected person status on the family home. So Billy's entering care and needs to have her residential care means test assessment completed. And this will include that capped value of the home together with 50% of their combined income and assets and Billy's entry to care will see her assessed as not low means, so she will be in the white area of our graph. She'll be required to pay accommodation costs negotiated with the chosen facility with no government subsidies applied, and this is either the refundable accommodation deposit or RAD as the lump sum, or the daily accommodation payment or DAP as the daily payment option. Billy will pay the same basic daily care fee and a small means tested care fee based on the recent residential care means test assessment. So looking now at Bob's aged care costs and remembering costs in residential care are reviewed every month once a person is in care. Now Bob entered care assessed as low means. He remains in the same place in care and he will continue to be assessed as low means. Now, where Bob initially entered care, the home was not included in means testing, and that saw the entire accommodation costs for Bob paid in government subsidies direct to the facility. Billy's move to care, however, is a change in circumstance, and it will now see the capped value of the home included in residential care means testing for Bob, and he will now be asked to pay the daily accommodation contribution or DAC and the maximum applicable DAC will apply, which is $68.14 per day. He will continue to pay the same basic daily care fee, and he will now also have that small means tested fee of about $1.20 a day. So Bob and Billy explore their options now that they're both in care. They first consider the option of holding on to that family home, but renting it to improve cash flow. They don't have a lot of capital there, so they wouldn't be really able to pay any lump sums toward their accommodation, and they would elect to pay them all as a daily amount in this option. The rental income they receive does result in a small reduction in their age pensions. So looking at their total combined income, in this option, it's around 2,745 a fortnight, but their combined expenses in aged care are up at 4,120 per fortnight. So that's a pretty big shortfall in meeting care costs. They could draw that down from the $80,000 they have in savings, but it will reduce quite quickly. So Bob and Billy then explore the option of selling their home. And what they would like to do is pay Billy's accommodation payment in full as a lump sum RAD. And we'll base the figures here on a net sale price for their home of $600,000. Billy's RAD is $400,000. So where that's paid in full, they would place the remaining $200,000 from the sale into their savings, taking that to a combined amount of $280,000. They'll continue to receive the maximum rates of pension under those illness separated rules. From an aged care means testing perspective, their combined savings of $280,000 is included, and so too is Billy's RAD, and that will reassess the costs in care at the next monthly review. Now, in this option, the bulk of their income is from their pensions. They've got a little bit of interest coming in from the $280,000 they have invested, and their total combined income is around $2,500 per fortnight. Their combined aged care expenses are just under $2,800 per fortnight. So we can see there, there is still a shortfall in meeting those expenses, but 
they do have a high amount of access to capital with that $280,000 in savings, and they can draw down on that to cover that shortfall along with their incidental expenses. Looking at the costs here individually, we can see there's been a small rise in the means tested fees, and that's due to the home being sold and no longer applying the capped value to the home. Also looking at those individual costs, we can see Billy is no longer paying any daily accommodation costs because she's elected to pay the RAD in full. So there's no longer a daily accommodation payment payable, but Bob is still paying his accommodation costs in full as a daily amount, that daily accommodation contribution or DAC. So to try and improve cash flow further, they could also consider paying a lump sum toward Bob's accommodation costs. And that would be a refundable accommodation contribution or RAC. If we look at an example where there's $250,000 further drawn from their combined savings to pay a RAC for Bob, this would leave them with about $30,000 in savings for incidental expenses. It will reduce the amount Bob is required to each to pay each day as a daily accommodation contribution where the facility are holding that lump sum RAC. Now, their assessable assets for pension purposes are lower because remember, the RAD and the RAC are not included as assets for Centrelink assessment, but for aged care means testing, they remain included in that residential care means test. So where Billy's RAD of $400,000 is paid in full from the sale proceeds of the home, and Bob elects to pay a RAC, of $250,000, the overall income for them is pretty much just the age pensions, and they've got around $2,260 a fortnight in income. We can see the overall costs here for them both are $1,993 per fortnight, and this is a positive cash flow situation. They have around $268 income per fortnight combined to cover those incidental expenses like medications and haircuts. They have $30,000 in savings that can be drawn on further for any extra spending. Now, at any point, Bob or Billy or both can look at the option of drawing down on the lump sums paid to aged care to cover a portion of their aged care outlay and increase their cash flow if that comes becomes an issue. Now, remember, drawing down on the RAD or the RAC reduces the, the balance that's held by the facility. So it will reduce the refund they receive when they leave, and it will increase the daily accommodation costs as the balance held by the aged care facility reduces. Now you might think here, well, if they've only got $30,000 in savings and it's starting to run out, couldn't they apply for aged care hardship assistance? And I did touch on hardship rules in our first two webinars. It's important to know that lump sums held by the aged care facility are included as an asset for aged care means testing, as I've mentioned, and this also transfers across to see them included for aged care hardship eligibility. Therefore, the $650,000 held between them by the aged care facility would not allow them to access hardship assistance at this time. And that's why that drawdown option on the RAD or the RAC would be a consideration at that point to improve their cash flow. So wrapping up our case study of Bob and Billy, we can see that when only one member of the couple entered care, Bob was assessed as low means. The only outlay was more than covered by the pension because Billy was a protected person still living in the family home. Once the second partner moved to care, it raised all those options then to consider like renting the home, selling the home, and even again, the possible need to draw down on those lump sum accommodations payments made to ensure cash flow was sufficient. Now, there's been a huge amount of information today as we've worked through both of our case studies. And I know there were lots of numbers and figures to try and take in. Remember, you can watch back the webinars and slow them down, pause them to take notes. It's not important to focus on the exact figures though. These are hypothetical case studies. What I would like you to take away from today's webinar, and indeed our three-part series, is that the costs around residential care are determined based on your individual situation, and there are many decisions to be made. Many, many of us have friends or neighbours 
who've been through the experience of a loved one entering residential care. They may try to help you and offer you information on their journey, but please remember that your experience needs to be considered taking into account your situation and your financial position. It's important to make your decisions armed with as much information as possible on your options. Please take advantage of our free services with the Financial Information Service and the Aged Care Specialist Offices. We can help you explore your options and give you the information you need tailored to your circumstances so that you can make informed decisions. I'm now going to hand back to Donna to wrap up our Aged Care webinar series. Thanks, Donna. Thank you, Mandy, for such wonderful and relevant information. Let's move our minds on now to the many ways that you can do your business with Centrelink and have a look at the supports we offer you to do this. We, we covered our online services in part one. So let's do a little recap and a reminder of how you can access us using simple and helpful tools. The most common way and now the most popular way to access our services is via the MyGov portal. MyGov is Australia's largest authenticated digital platform. MyGov provides essential functions to help people access government services online. To access services in MyGov, it's just one logon, one username, and best of all, one password. And then you have access to opportunity of linking around 15 different services. Now, the most common ones are Centrelink, Medicare, Child Support, and the Australian Taxation Office. We have a digital assistant to help you whilst you are using MyGov if you get stuck or you need to ask any questions. You'll find it at the bottom right hand side of the sign in page. Now it can handle many questions, but a few questions might be, how can I create a MyGov account? Or how do I sign in to MyGov? There's always help available if you're having trouble navigating MyGov or any of our online services. Our official YouTube channel offers step-by-step -step guides and information on various ranges of topics via instructional videos and support with Services Australia business. MyGov also offers a MyGov help desk. Our Services Australia website offers support with online guides. To access these is simple. Just search online guides in the search box. You can even have a digital coaching appointment to boost your confidence by with using our online services. Now, the Financial Information Service has video on demand or VODs as we know them. Now, they're simple and helpful videos to, that will cover a range of topics, including things like deeming, gifting, selling the family home, managed funds, shares, choosing investments, helping our farmers and aged care. On the screen now, you will find a list of contact details for some of the other services offered, offered by us here at Services Australia. Depending on your circumstances, you might want to make contact with a social worker or maybe a multicultural or Indigenous officer to provide you and your family with the support that you require. We also have TTY, which is Tally Typewriter Phone. Please reach out for support if you need it, as we are here to help. Let's talk about our webinars. We have over 15 available for viewing on our website. They are easy to access from your own home. And if you can't make the live event, you can still watch the recording and pause and play when required. There's also a list of up and coming webinars that might be of interest to you. So why not share this information with your family and friends? This third and concluding part of our three part series will be added to our website after today's live event so that you can catch up, pause and rewatch it at any time. Our next live webinar is on gifting and lump sums. It will be run on Wednesday, the 18th of September. We would love for you to attend. Let me now remind you of how you can contact the Financial Information Service. Our service can be accessed by calling any of our payment lines. Now, if your inquiry is detailed, we will offer you a video chat appointment. Now, this is a one-on-one -on -one video chat. 
It allows you to discuss your personal circumstances with one of our experienced Viz officers. You might choose to have your partner, nominee, family member or third party present. So that might be your accountant or financial planner. And the great thing is this can all be done from the comfort of your own home. Video chat appointments have proven to be a popular option with people meeting with us. Now to participate in the video chat with us, you will need to have a MyGov account. You'll need your Centrelink account linked and be subscribed to our online letters. You'll then give us a call on 132300 or any of our phone lines to book in this one on one video chat with our financial information service. Now we do have face to face appointments in some of our service centres. And lastly, I would like you that you can still scroll up and down in our Q&A window to see the published questions and answers and all of those helpful links. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope that you have enjoyed all of the wonderful information that Mandy and our team of moderators have shared with you today and over the past previous two sessions. We are excited to share more information with you and look forward to you joining us in the future as we build these live webinars and topics that might be of interest to you. Thanks for joining us today and we do hope that you enjoy the rest of your day.